Recently, the biggest news from the Indian aviation industry has been the completion of the transfer of the majority stake of Air India from the majority government control to Tata Sons, the founding company of the airline. It is a major shift for Air India, which has been the flying symbol of the nation of India, which for more than seven decades has been a majority held by government. However, the airline has been in turbulent skies, facing financial struggles and also challenges from other Indian-based airlines. While Air India has lost significant ground to competitors locally and abroad, the airline has been a major player in the history of the aviation industry in India. And now the airline is looking to return to the glory days to return to Tata Sun. With that said, this video will take a look at the history of Air India. Like many of its global aviation counterparts, Air India had its start thanks to a local aviation pioneer. For Air India, that man was Jahangir Ratanji Daboy Tata, or JRD Tata. If you are not familiar with the Indian business scene, JRD Tata comes from the Tata family of India, which happens to be a major player in the business scene. Their family holds one of the oldest conglomerates in the business scene of India, Tata Sons, which has been in existence since 1868. The family to Tata would become the pioneers of aviation in India, thanks to his early interest in aviation. Being born in the early 1900s, it also happened to be a time when aviation was just starting with the Wright Brothers' flight and the ensuing early developments. Considered to be the father of Indian aviation, Tata became the first Indian person to get his pilot's license, which according to some stories, he got it after a three and a half hour flight with an instructor. Now for many, the interest in aviation would end at having a pilot's license. But being part of the family business, Tata was also looking for business opportunities in aviation in the country. That opportunity when Tata would secure a mail contract with the Imperial Air Service in India in the 1930s and that would lead to the formation of the Tata Air Service. One of his right-hand men happened to be Neville Vincent, who along with being a friend of Tata, also happened to be a former British Royal Air Force pilot. In 1932, Tata Sun's company would make the initial investment for the new air service, which paved the way for the new air service, the first in India to start. So with that, the very first commercial flight of the Indian aviation industry operated by Tata Air Service took place on October 15, 1932. At the controls of the de Havilland Postmoth used on the flight from Karachi, Pakistan to Mumbai was Tata himself, before then relinquishing the controls to Vincent, who took over the flight from Mumbai to Chennai, which was then called Madras. From then, Tata Air Service would expand its domestic mail services, along with carrying some passengers along the way. Then another major landmark would take place in 1938 as the airline would be renamed as Tata Airlines, which then started its first international flight to Colombo, Sri Lanka. However, the fledging airline would see a hiatus during World War II as its focus would be shifted, operating support flights in Saudi Arabia between Europe and Asia for the British military. The years after World War II would mark a major turn for India and its history as it became an independent country in 1947. However, before that, there was a name change also for Tata Sons in 1946 being renamed Air India. Then, in the major shift in 1948, the Indian government started to get involved with the airline, getting a 49% stake. Following that, the airline would take on its mascot, the Maharaja, and flights would be started from between Mumbai and London Heathrow, along with the start of services to Nairobi, Kenya. At this time, Air India did have some other competitors, though this would change as skies over India would be nationalized. In 1953, the Indian government passed the Air Corporations Act, which saw the acquisition of the majority stake in the airline to the Indian government. Of the nine airlines operating in the country, those would be downsized to two, with Air India becoming the primary international airline officially operating as Air India International, while domestic flights would be operated separately by India Airlines. While Tata Sons as the company would be relinquishing control of the airline, Tata would still remain as the chairman of the airline until 1977. 
As the flag carrier of India, the years after nationalization would see an expansion of its network across continents. Flights would be started to cities such as Tokyo, Hong Kong, Bangkok, and Singapore, and by the 1960s, the airline received its very first Boeing 707 aircraft. The airline also happened to be an advanced airline compared to others, as in 1962, it became an all-jet airline fleet. This expansion would continue into the 1970s as the Boeing 747 was introduced. As Air India was the international flag carrier, domestically, Indian airlines introduced airlines such as the Sud Aviation Caravelle, the 737s, and the Airbus A300s. The two airlines would be the primary carriers for domestic and international travelers of the country for the next few decades. However, their position would begin to be challenged as the Indian government was making moves in the 1980s and the 1990s to liberalize the skies over the country. Domestically, this would result in the erased monopoly for India Airlines. On the other side of this, there were still developments in both India Airlines and Air India. Among these changes were more bigger aircraft such as the Airbus A310, which Air India would be the largest operator of. By the 1990s, the airline would receive its 747s, including the 747-300, which was a mixed passenger and cargo aircraft, along with the 747-400, which would allow non-stop flights from India to cities like Chicago and New York in the U.S. As Air India continued to reach farther destinations, there would be some plans and attempts to entice the airline. The discussion on whether to privatize Air India or not would start in the early 2000s as there were questions of whether the airline could continue to be part of the Indian government. While being the flying symbol of Air India as a national flag carrier, critics noticed that the airline was incurring losses for the government being a state-owned entity and this was also affecting India Airlines. Adding to this was a scandal involving a managing director over corruption charges. Along with recent economic troubles during these times, there was growing political opposition for Air India to be a government entity. This would lead to some changes to the airline, which were also partially made in response to the changing landscape of the aviation industry. In 2005, Air India formed a subsidiary for domestic budget operations, Air India Express. This would lead to further reorganizations, including the merger of Air India and India Airlines in 2007, and with that, Air India would be a both domestic and international flight operator. Still, the financial problems were mounting. While the airline welcomed the Boeing 777s in the 2000s, it also made some big aircraft purchases. Yet the airline was having mounting losses, leading to the Indian government making a restructuring plan worth around US$6 billion US dollars in 2012. These struggles would affect the airline's reputation globally as the airline was also having negotiations for a membership to the Star Alliance, which postponed it due to the failure to meet minimum standard membership requirements. With the state of the airline, there were a series of financial assistance to the airline as it lost ground domestically especially to the likes of competitors like Indigo, Jet Airways, and SpiceJet. As Air India navigated its struggles, in 2013, it moved its headquarters from Mumbai to Delhi. Despite the challenges, there were some good news as in 2014, after delays, the airline finally became a member of the Star Alliance and there was continued support from private and public sources to continue to aid the airline's financial situation. It was also during this time in the 2010s that the airline would modernize its fleet with Boeing 787s arriving and then the Airbus A320 NEOs. However, the main focus of the airline and the Indian government was for plans for privatization of the airline, which after years of discussion and debate, the serious push to sell the majority stake of Air India to private hands was started in 2017. The first attempt to sell the airline was in 2018, the offer of 76% stake of the airline. This did not attract buyers in part because as some has reported that there was still a government stake being held. This failure did not deter the Indian government from selling the airline, as it then offered 100% stake in a new round of bidding in 2020. Despite the challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and 2021, 
This time, the round of bidding attracted several potential offers. The noteworthy offers were from Tata Sons, and also one from Ajay Singh, the chief stakeholder of SpiceJet. After reviewing its bids, it was announced in October of 2021 that Tata Sons was awarded the winning bid for the airline, paving the way for the return of the Indian flag carrier to its founding company. Tata Sons will be regaining control of Air India after relinquishing control of the airline nearly 70 years ago. It takes over the Delhi-based airline with a combined fleet with Air India Express of around 141 aircraft, 117 with Air India, and 24 jets under Air India Express. The combined fleet does have some issues with fleet commonality, especially with the operations of both Boeing and Airbus aircraft. Among the notable differences is in the narrow-body fleet, with Air India having an Airbus A320 fleet family aircraft, while Air India Express operates 737-800s. With the combined fleet, Air India has around 100 destinations, from the main hubs of Delhi, Mumbai, along with Bengaluru, Chennai, Hyderabad, Kochi, and Ahmedabad. Looking towards the future, it is a momentous occasion for Tata Sons having the seeing the return of Air India to the company. Though it comes in a different circumstances and situation compared to when it relinquished control in the 1950s. Today the skies over India and around the world has changed. And there will be internal challenges for Tata Sons to take on. An example of these challenges is the flexibility with the current deals they have and how soon can they make crucial moves to turn around the airline especially with existing contracts and agreements with the workforce. However, we can't forget that while Tata Sons relinquished control of Air India nearly 70 years ago, today it also happens to be a major player in the aviation industry, having major stakes in Air Asia India and premium airline Vistara. I do believe that the benefits of the experiences of Tata Sons with these two airlines will help Air India position itself better in the aviation industry. Tata Sons will be taking on the legacy of Air India, which has shaped the course of aviation in India. Now, it's looking to shape its future. And I do want to bring up the mascot, the Maharaja, which does actually have more historical meaning. In Hindu, it's a title of a great king or ruler of a state in India. As for how this plays into the future of Air India, I do want to mention that lately in India's aviation industry, Air India has lost ground and it's not really the king or the ruler of its competition. There are criticisms of the airlines that has been levied over the years. Now with the airline back to where it came from, can Tata Sons once again bring the airline back to reclaim its spot as the Maharaja of the skies over India? I definitely hope you enjoyed this video and I do also want to hear your thoughts on the state of Air India and how do you see the future playing out as it returns to Tata Sons. In the meantime, this has been Flights in Asia, highlighting the news and updates from the aviation and travel scene in the Asia Pacific. Along with the videos and more on this YouTube channel, you can also see some of the latest news and updates on the Flights in Asia website at www.flightsinasia.com. In closing, thank you for watching and have a great day.